Welcome to CivilNet. My guest today is Georgi Derlugian, Professor of Historical Sociology at the University of New York in Abu Dhabi. Professor, thank you for your time. Good afternoon. And uh, whenever you come to this studio, we are discussing the macro-historical, macro-sociological perspective and what is happening here in our region and in a broader region. But we rarely contemplate on uh, what is not happening. So I want to understand what is not happening and why. Thank you. It's a very philosophical question. Now, the most difficult things to notice are the ones happening right before your eyes, which you don't see because you take it for granted. Uh, we live through a very dangerous, the English word is fraught, fraught period in world history, uh, which qualifies to be called a world war. It did not start yesterday. It did not start with Ukraine. Uh, since the collapse of Soviet Union in 1991, which took everyone by surprise. Of course, in Yerevan and around the world, perhaps, a great many people believe that this was someone's plan. This is a typical human trait, to attribute chaos to some plan, to see patterns in random events. That was a collapse. A collapse in a sense of train collision, a catastrophe. But that catastrophe passed hardly noticed by uh, people in their daily life because they were so of course you know, so it was so difficult to maintain normalcy and yet the people made an effort to maintain normal life water was still mostly running from the faucets people were still taking children to kindergartens in armenia it was more severe because of the blockade it was uh, a more difficult situation and still considering the what was common in previous world wars, famine, massacres, you know, the most the direst parts of those, you know, it was life was strangely normal. Yet at the global level, the world uh, order became unstable precisely for the reason you know that uh, previously it had kind of three legs. There was the first world to remind you, the second world, first world, American alliance, capitalist, as they call themselves, you know, democratic powers. There was the second world of socialist or Soviet bloc and its satellites. And then there was the third world of basically everybody else who didn't uh, want to take a position and wanted to promote themselves to equality with superpowers. Suddenly there is one superpower left. One of the superpowers basically goes into the ditch in the 1990s. Uh, I have a whole article actually comparing um, American and Soviet trajectories, and it is quite uncanny actually that both superpowers in the 1950s stood very proud, claiming that they, they primarily defeated fascism and liberated the humanity. That they left the horrors of the 1930s behind. For Americans, it was depression. For the Soviets, it was Stalinist repression. They discovered scientific ways of managing economy, society. So these uh, images from the late 1950s, uh, scientists in white gowns with huge um, uh, computers uh, offering to the politicians incredible tools for avoiding uh, new economic disasters for scientifically bringing every, everything you know to fruition and yes they sent men in space they sent men in the, on the moon uh, ancient disease plague was eliminated you know polio polio you know from which president roosevelt had suffered just a generation before was eliminated by joint efforts and what remained for the two superpowers to join together Remember, you know, some people might remember the word uh, coexistence and convergence. They converge. 
America, the West, started from the extremes of market-free economy. The Soviets started from the extremes of state-run, but the Soviets were becoming moving more towards market reform. Uh, Americans were becoming kind of more regulated in, in the West, you know, more welfare-oriented, and they're moving towards some kind of a golden mean. And what remained was to offer something to the third world, to the rest of the humanity, our way. The working class or the middle class will bring everybody overcoming traditional society or feudal society to managed market economy or socialist, whatever it is. Uh, both superpowers stumbled for the first time. It was the signal crisis. Before, signal, uh, before terminal crisis, there is always a signal crisis, like just stumbling. For Americans, it was Vietnam. For the Soviets, it was Afghanistan. Nobody expected this to last long. Nobody expected to cost that much, both in terms of money, human life, and especially political prestige. What kind of superpower you are. And this kind of an, uh, two superpowers going through very similar difficulties had different results because it does make a difference when your allies or your satellites are West Germany and Japan or Bulgaria and Mongolia. So Russia, or as the inheritor of the Soviet Union, went into the ditch. Part of that was what we celebrate as Armenian independence. Of course, you know, many people were waving flags about it, you know, so freedom of small nations, while in fact it was um, closer to the falling apart of previously pyramid structure. So parts of the pyramid, you know, fell out and rolled in different directions. And this is a collapse which quite few people actually appreciate how traumatic and how deep was that collapse in the 1990s. So when people speak today about Armenian state is not properly managed, not properly bureaucratic, not properly technocratic, there is no state service, it's not really national state, you know, people forget, you know, that in the 1990s there was essentially no state. You know, that it had collapsed almost entirely in so many parts of the former Soviet Union. It was being rebuilt and very slowly and mostly by default, because as I said, people continue doing the same thing. But some countries succeeded. Uh, it's very uncanny. You know, we have many uh, explanations who succeeded. And you know, the simplest explanation, unfortunately, because it kind of almost negates a lot of theories, if you had a common border with the European Union. From Lithuania, actually, if you look into the uh, political scientists' journals, uh, Sovietology journals, you know, there was such a discipline from the 1970s, almost nobody predicted Karabakh as a focal point of conflict that could lead to the demise of superpower. But so many of them spoke about Estonia or Lithuania, you know, because there were. Historical structures were not like, unlike uh, Croatia, for instance. Uh, people's, but somehow, very few people even noticed that Poland, which had lost Vilna or Vilnius, one of its major cities, not just a village, in 1939, due to the uh, partition of Poland between Hitler and Stalin, Stalin had transferred the capital of Lithuania. <laughs> into its possession in October 1939. And yet, not a pip, that Hungary did not go to reclaim Transylvania. And you remember, the great Transylvania. We don't hear about Transylvania. So what happened? You know, so very important things to notice are the things that did not happen. And yet, Karabakh happened because Karabakh was too far away. It was kind of written off. This might be changing now. Sorry, let me skip it because this is important. You know. In the early 2000s, nobody quite knew what would be the new world order. Because the NATO, kind of you know, Western alliance, still stood, but what was it doing? But what do was the know, purpose? Do we know now it, how the new world order would look like? We know it would look differently. You know, so uh, we are observing now the collapse of old, uh, what is so painful and frightening about this moment, <laughs> moment, 
you know, moment in history can last 20 years. You know, uh, we are observing the collapse of old order. You know, so first, the United States after 9-11, this is, you know, remember such date? War on terror, remember such things? You know, so first, you know, they uh, tried to mobilize under uh, the slogan of war on drugs. You know, then there was war on terror. Where are those wars? Uh, there was invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, and these were actually very well thought daring plans, daring to the point of madness. Once you look into this plan, you know, had it worked, yes, American conservatives would, be, would have been right. You know, it would have secured the uh, preeminent position of the United States for another se century. No China, of course, Europe would never be able, uh, would, would be part of that um, pyramid. At the top of the pyramid, you know, we know who would be and why, but that did not work. And this was the invitation, apparently, for Russia and China. Who, who are the powers which gained from the American defeat in Iraq? We can actually see that. Number one, Iran. Iran gained, and for a while, Iran pursued suddenly a very activist foreign, pol foreign subversion policy from Yemen to Syria, you know, wherever they could find Shia minorities. Because, you know, the support of Iran is geopolitically limited to co-religionists, and there are not very many. And this is what is making Azerbaijan a big exception. Shows you that this theoretically or historically should be a Shia country, yet it is not a friend, let, to put it mildly, of Iran, not a good neighbor. So, uh, Iran, number one, for a while, while the, uh, Iran had just a few resources and a lot of energy in the ruling military elite of Iran, those generals of uh, Islamic Republic who had been students probably in the early 1980s, they are revolutionaries. They were never able to bring their revolution to spread it around the world because they were contained first by the Saddam's war, then by the United States, the sanctions. Suddenly it all fell down and Iran went on a spree of conquest. Second, of course, uh, biggest beneficiary was China, simply because China was left alone by George W. Bush and his successors. You know, for almost 20 years, China was left alone and was left you know, to consolidate its position economically and geopolitically to mature into a new superpower, which we are observing now. But also, apparently, uh, Russia considered under Putin you know, considered that they have benefited from the American defeat. Look, you know, they did not do much better than us in Afghanistan. They did disastrously all over there. And besides, to remind you, these former Soviet republics belong to us. You know, that this is not yours. Stop all your shenanigans with the Soros Foundation or whatever, the promotion of democracy. Us here speaking English. Uh, get out you know, of Georgia. And this was the first war uh, 2008, you know, to make sure that Georgia doesn't become NATO member. And 2022, you know, this is the Russian invasion and openly in a massive invasion of Ukraine. Because, you know, the first, you know, 2014 was already, you know, quite an invasion, but they were very careful to maintain plausible deniability, as they call it. No, these are the Donbass rebels. No, you know, they are buying their tanks in supermarkets or something, you know, the, uh, these kind of very bad jokes. Uh, 2022, it was a plan as mad or as daring as the American invasion of the Middle East. Had it worked, and it could, uh, all former Soviet republics would be within the Russian orbit by now, and that prominently includes Armenia. So now we see that uh, war in Karabakh in 2020 was part of the puzzle. And those of you who know Russian, I urge you, you know, just go online and look up Prigozhin, Karabakh, 2020. So I, I was about yeah. coming to this question. So you penned an article uh, one year before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the article in the book Storm Over the Caucasus was mm -hmm. entitled uh, World War of Local Significance. And uh, this was 
2020 or 2021. So, and uh, the idea was that this was a world war with the involvement of regional powers, etc. But at that time, nobody could could have predicted what would happen in one year. So, and the and Russia's invasion of Ukraine changed the puzzle, changed the ge geopolitical situation here. And now we have this unpredictable and uncertain situation. Uh, can we have a sort of strategy in this sort, in this kind of situation where we have more unpredictability than uh, than certainty? Uh, so can can Armenia rely, for example, on the West, on Russia, on or just uh, behave uh, uh, in, by inertia, play by inertia? What, what would be the best way for Armenia to? To play? I'm afraid in such a situation there can be no plan. Strategy there could be, but strategy means keeping your eyes on the goal. You must very clearly recognize your goals. And for Armenia, this is relatively simple because the goal is such a big, glaring survival. That's the goal. You know, Armenia must survive through this period. Uh, strategy must be changing all the time. You know, it should be very pliable. So it's more like uh, in some martial arts. You know, so you don't know from which side might come a blow. But you should be uh, prepared instantaneously, you know, to drop and bounce back. Uh, this means that, of course, you must train physically. You know, you must be fit uh, for this. In terms of uh, states, this means that you must have, you must care, you must cultivate popular legitimacy. There must be support. It must uh, not be a state that can easily uh, crumple down. You know, it must be a state. You know, where the state employees. And state employees, anything you know, from teachers and medical personnel to military to economic management, must understand you know that we are in a storm and we are navigating towards survival. So we have um, Lee Kuan Yew, founding prime minister, legendary prime minister of Singapore, uh, used to say that I have a couple million lives. And my responsibility, you know, that I always recommend, you know, watching Declaration of Independence of Singapore in 1965. It's on YouTube. Uh, for the first 28 seconds, Lee Kuan Yew is crying. He cannot even utter a word, you know, because that independence was forced on Singapore, and the people of Singapore were essentially refugees from neighboring countries where they were threatened with genocide for the um, faults, which would sound very familiar to many Armenians. Because you are too smart, you are capitalists exploiting our simple, nice local people, or because you are foreign minority, you are communists who are trying to subvert our, our traditional values. And for both, you know, being too capitalist and too socialist, you, know, you should be expelled, our country should be purified of you. So this is where any Armenian would, would understand Chinese without translation. So that might be uh, a pattern to look into, not because of economic success as it is usually presented, but because economic success in Singapore was actually predicated on escaping genocide or threat of genocide. So we are in a situation comparable to world wars. They happen. Uh, not, not just in the 20th century, you know, Napoleonic Wars, or what we know as Seven Year War in the 18th century, or Americans know as the French Indians War, American War of Independence, was one of the conflicts in that war. So these are long periods, taking decades sometimes, when it is not quite clear who is laying down the rules of the game. Between them, there are periods when the rules become more or less certain. So Europe, between, say, 
the Battle of Waterloo, 1815, and World War I, 1914, almost 100 years of quite solid peace with intermittent you know, uh, Franco-Prussian War, probably unification of Italy, you know, but mostly you know, Europe achieves you know, enormous technological advances, prosperity, but also re European revolutions happen in the 19th century. It's a very important century, it's probably the most important century in human history. Uh, and it was peaceful between Napoleon and, say, Kaiser Wilhelm and, you know, these two big wars. We are in a comparable period when there are many local wars, but when you... Syria or Iraq, different wars, or Yemen or Karabakh or maybe Ethiopia. You know, don't forget about Ethiopia, very serious uh, conflicts there. Or maybe it's not exactly a war, but uh, serious turmoil in Latin America, you know, which is changing uh, the patterns of power and political behavior in whole countries, in important countries like Chile or Brazil or Mexico. So we are moving through disorder. So this is like earthquakes and a series of earthquakes, you know, because the tectonic plates are in flux. They are moving. And in this situation, you should be just nimble. You should be prepared to jump from one position to another. And Armenia is in exactly such a situation right now because we are, as Armenia has always been actually, you know, for the last uh, two and a half thousand years, at the fault lines between tectonic plates moving somewhere. Uh, my prediction, and I don't think you know, it's, it's any longer you know, such, such a daring prediction, is that Russia is not just losing this war. Russia essentially lost its bid in Ukraine. So the Russian plan now looks... And in this is what you said right after Russia's yes. invasion of Ukraine. You said that by now we're The war is already lost. Uh, this was beginning of March when it transpired that Russian troops had stopped. And if you stop, if there is a battlefront solidifying, you fail to take Kiev, yes. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, bids for world power can be accomplished only in one push, all, all of a sudden. And by the way, this is, you know, I don't say, you know, that uh, the ruling regime in Russia is fascist. But this is what makes it similar in strategy to Japanese military, to the Navy, attacking Pearl Harbor. It was a brilliantly designed attack. Militarily speaking, it was brilliantly designed and executed. It was very cruel and it was hopeless in the longer run, you know, because you know, the size of a Japanese economy against American. But the, uh, the expectation was that they knocked down the United States and maybe uh, this democracy was, would collapse. Hitler uh, and Mussolini had similar expectations, probably at the beginning of Second World War. Why? Not only because they were evil, because they were weaker. They had concentrated, mobilized power, so they knew that they have the momentum and they must use this power now or they fail. You jump, they jumped and failed. If you, luckily for the humanity. So if you don't reach uh, immediately the goal, but the goal was actually within reach. Because many things, as I said, you know, in um, chaotic transitions uh, in world affairs, happen randomly. Something happened in Kazakhstan. Something to the extent I, I visited Kazakhstan uh, a month ago, and the colleagues there don't even have a name for it. They still call it the events, the events of January 2022. Whatever happened there, but remember, you know, uh, almost ironic situation when Armenia was presiding in the uh, pro-Russian, form, formally presiding on a rotational basis in the Russian military alliance. What in is CSTO? CSTO. Thank you. You know, I always forget. You know, what is the the English for that? You know, this kind of Russia's NATO version. Uh, troops were sent to Kazakhstan, and amazingly. They were within, what, one week or two weeks, they were withdrawn. And we could not understand why. So I always urge people in analysis to notice uh, anomalies. So why is that? Russian um, peacekeepers in Karabakh looked apparently forever. There was absolutely no reason why would the Russians ever move out of there. Because it was a brilliant situation, although I 
it was a brilliant result for Russia, not for Armenia, not for the people of Artsakh, and not for Azerbaijan. When Russian troops, along with Armenian troops, were on what Azerbaijan claimed to be its territory, with the Turkish troops, and we don't know, you know which other organizations, maybe Israelis, maybe someone else. So this was a situation that, in my opinion, could not last, yet it looked like Russia was in control, and that's why Russia was, uh, Moscow was insisting on opening the communications, as they call it, because they needed to supply. Of course, uh, in Gumri, there is a Russian military base. Can they bring tanks across Georgia? No. Can they bring them by airplane? Costly, useless. Gumri Russian base is closest to Syria, and yet it could not be used in the Russian operation in Syria. So in order to make it more operational, Russia needed you know, more foothold in the South Caucasus. Russia needed uh, to make sure that uh, Central Asia doesn't drift into anyone else's sphere of influence, Turkish or Chinese, God forbid, Afghan, Taliban, or Iranian, which is very unlikely. And do, you, do you think Russia would leave the region if it, if it loses the battle in Ukraine? I uh, mean the Caucasus. Uh, this is not, uh, this is a question of ability. Would Russia be able, you know, would there be enough troops, material, and money to support it? What would be the uh, tools left? So, what we don't know, we know that Russia is losing and virtually lost the war. We don't know the score. We know that the attempt to create, I, I don't think, you know, that Putin ever had an idea of recreating Soviet Union. He's not a communist like by far. As you see, he is conservative and basically a very rich man. And the people around him are there to be rich. And they also wanted to be influential and maybe, if they're not respected in the West, at least feared. So they wanted to show that they are a major world power. Uh, they failed in that. And now we don't know the score. We, don't, we know that the countries uh, with ambitions to win uh, at least a chunk of world domination uh, suffer very painful defeats and all kinds of bad things happen to them. We don't know yet what kind of things are going to happen to Russia. Will it be a palace coup? So far, no. Will uh, this cause uh, to the opposite uh, solidification, uh, uh, coalescing of very reactionary uh, Russian elites around Putin. So let's fight to the very bitter end. So we cannot afford to lose it now. So that is also possible. But there is, in any strategy, there is the question of ability. So there, I don't think you know, there is power to be projected. And much in this situation depends on what Turkey and Azerbaijan would wish to do. Evidently, Russia is becoming a hostage of Turkish and Azerbaijani uh, interests. And the interest of Azerbaijan is the interest of Aliyev's family, or whatever you know, is you know, his wife and her clan family. But this is a familial state. And this is a vassal of Turkey. Vassal in a very literate sense of paying tribute. Uh, and I'm quite sure that they're paying tribute, you know, both in terms of cash, and in terms of access to the resources, uh, I don't believe for a second that Mr. Erdogan was doing anything in Azerbaijan. You know, uh, I don't think he's doing anything anywhere. You know, just for ideological purposes. You know, so ideology is always much better when it is being paid for. Uh, so uh, Russia finds itself in a situation when the survival of a severely weakened regime is predicated in part on the survival or on the prestige of a strengthened regime in Azerbaijan because that regime is very similar to Russian regime. It's an oil, corrupt, uh, ultra-nationalist uh, dictatorship uh, based on family and not quite state rule, but rather in a family patrimonial, as we call it. However, Azerbaijan, unlike Russia, won the previous war and Azerbaijan cannot settle for anything less than victory, because then what would be the justification for the existence of Aliyev's regime? Especially if oil, as predicted, is going to run out or the prices are going to drop. So this is why uh, 
I concur with Eric Hakopian, you know, who is saying, you know, that there cannot be a durable, peaceful settlement with Azerbaijan right now, simply because uh, Azerbaijan's ruling regime, not the whole people, not the country, but Aliyev would uh, be shooting himself in both feet if he settles for anything durable. He might be forced into this. He might be forced by certain Western interests who are interested not only in Armenia for kind of whatever good nature of Armenian people, its history, its democra democratic rule today. They might be interested much more somewhere in Europe, in Baku as both uh, source of energy, but also a source of a transit point on the roads to China, to Asia in general. Uh, so it's quite uh, evident, you know, that people who are planning uh, they are not easy strategies as well, you know, somewhere in Brussels or in Berlin, in Paris. They must be thinking in these terms. You know, they cannot entirely lose Azerbaijan. But that includes preventing Azerbaijan from doing something so ugly that they, in, in the West, would face their own public opinion or, you know, the circumstances, you know, for, political circumstances forcing them into writing off Azerbaijani regime. So some, some, so stay in place. Don't do anything ugly. Uh, you might survive. We cannot promise much to you. So I'm quite sure that in general, this is what both Ilham Aliyev and Nikol Pashinyan or Mirzoyan are hearing from their Western partners. Uh, something will happen. You know, just uh, don't do anything extremely violent and stupid. Mostly to Baku, because they have many more possibilities to do something very stupid and very violent. Uh, for Armenia, the best uh, strategy, as I said, is uh, strengthening the, the society and the state. Not just the military, but bouncing back from uh, disaster. And last thing I wanted to mention, for the last three days, for instance, there was this wonderful celebration of the music of Aram Khachaturian near the Tumo, you know, open air. Uh, three ballets in a row, sometimes under rain, because it rains every evening in, in Yerevan. How normal was that? Actually, it was a festival. Lots of people with children, children running around, people had fun, they celebrate Armenian culture. They could now showcase it to so many visitors. Yerevan is overflowing with visitors. And many people who were there were commenting on what surprised them, you know, just how orderly was the crowd? Actually, Ar quarters. Armenians are not very orderly people, but definitely they are polite. Uh, two s uh, small boys ran into me because they were running. You know, Tumor has these wonderful slopes. Uh, and of course, this is inviting for children to climb the slope and then run down. And it's very difficult to stop. You know, so they bump into me and apologize. Okay, let's finish on this positive note. My guest was Professor of Historical Sociology, Georgi Derlugan. Keep watching CivilNet. Mm -hmm.